flexibility is always a good thing. But we we also need space <coughs> for other presenters to, to do their piece. So the next paper uh, is entitled Can Teaching Practice Address Gender Inequality in STEM as explored through self-efficacy? And the presenter is Gintare Alubek. Right. And Gintare is a postgraduate research student at TU Dublin. Uh, she received uh, her master in education in education policy and administration from Vilnius University, lovely city Vilnius, <laughs> uh, in 2021. And her research interests interest includes academic well-being, diversity and inclusion, and political and organizational change within the sector of higher education. So thank you for okay. being here, Tintare, um, and the floor is yours. Right. Thank you so much. Um, hi, everyone. So today I will be presenting a couple of findings from my um, ANFL project, which I have completed recently under the supervision of um, Dr. Bad Ryan and Professor Michael Theory. I'll be talking about self-efficacy a lot today, um, or student confidence beliefs in regard to their um, uh, perceived capability to successfully perform in specific academic contexts. Um, Self-efficacy has a predictive power over a variety of areas of academic functioning, so, uh, domain selection, uh, motivation, um, performance and achievement as well. So naturally it's really important for educational researchers. We know that um, students under, underrepresented in the sciences tend to have lower self-efficacy beliefs. So women and gender minority students tend to have lower self-efficacy beliefs towards science, uh, towards their science capability. What we also know is that certain pedagogical practices can um, increase student self-efficacy. So therefore, um, specific pedagogical um, self-efficacy interventions have been suggested as well having the power to really um, support women and gender minority students in their academic endeavors and close um, the educational gaps between um, women and gender minority students and the rest. So my research focused on two um, main questions. Um, number one being, you know, I, I was just interested to find out how confident um, first year undergraduate STEM students are at TU Dublin um, and then exploring certain patterns as well uh, based on you know a, a variety of different demographic um, factors not all of which we will have time to discuss today but we will look at gender specifically and then um, really looking into which pedagogical practice seems to be correlated with increased student self-efficacy. So um, what I did first was um, administer a self-efficacy questionnaire in 15 different undergraduate STEM classes and the results of the questionnaire really show that um, the students at TU Dublin, the undergraduate students, are really quite confident. Um, only 20, about 21 percent of students were in the low confidence category um, 56 percent for moderately confident, 23 percent for highly confident. Um, the self-efficacy questionnaire included four different items. So students were asked to identify their um, self-efficacy um, in regard to their capability to understand the most difficult concepts, um, learn different skills, uh, do well on assignments, so graded and ungraded classwork and continual assignments. Um, and do well on exams in their classes. Although um, most of the answers, most of the student answers were fairly consistent uh, throughout the different items, we do see that um, students were the most confident towards um, performing well on assignments and least confident um, when it came to performing well on exams. If we analyze the results by gender, we see that Female students um, had the lowest share of high confidence um, students, while male students had the lowest share of low confidence students. 
And then female students were the most confident, uh, sorry, the least confident on average, while male students were the most confident <laughs> on average. Um, when it comes to gender minority students, we, we, we do see a couple of very interesting things as well. So gender minority students had the highest share of low confidence students and the highest share of high confidence students at the same time. So um, what we can really tell him this is that gender minority students really have really different experiences of um, first year education. Um, but what is really important for us to acknowledge here is that um, 36 percent, so more than a third of low confidence students, that really shows us that gender minority students are in um, in need of a lot of support because really, uh, you know, low confidence students, those are the students that are at the highest risk of disengagement and attrition um, and they are the most likely to drop out or switch to a non STEM study program if they're not having a good time, so to say. Um, in the classes where self efficacy questionnaires were administered, um, this, well, those classes were also observed by me. And uh, some additional data was also collected. Very quickly, I'll go through some of it. Um, it appears that students were least confident in a laboratory setting. So here we see the mean score for the self efficacy questionnaires. 16 points were the, you know, the total number of points. So the maximum that students could achieve on the questionnaire. So in a laboratory setting, students were the least confident. Um, they were the most confident in um, a high attendance setting, actually. So in classes where more than 70 students were present, students were also the most confident, which is very really surprising, um, considering that previous research has shown that, you know, perhaps students are more confident in a more intimate setting. Um, and uh, another surprising revelation is that um, students became less and less confident as the semester progressed. So we see that, <laughs> um, yeah, over the three weeks <laughs> in which um, the self-efficacy questionnaires were administered, students in, in week four of instruction had the lowest self-efficacy. Um, in the class, well, the classes that were observed, there were the, the, the activities in those um, classes, so both um, student and instructor activities were coded following the COPUS observation protocol. Um, one thing that was really um, obvious from the observations was that when it came to practice based classes, when it came to tutorials and laboratories, um, if instructors utilize a variety of active uh, learning um, practices, students were considerably more confident in those classes, whereas practice based classes, so laboratories and tutorials, again, that resembled a lecture had a much higher number of students in the low confidence category. So here we have two laboratories um, for comparison. So th that was the laboratory just up here uh, with the highest self-efficacy mean. And this is a laboratory with the lowest self-efficacy mean. So as we can tell, students in the high self-efficacy laboratory were engaged in um, other group work for the most, or the, the code other group work was the most present in that class. Um, there was some listening, um, taking notes. There are a couple of student questions. Students answered a couple of questions as well, but primarily they were engaged in group work. And the instructor in that class we see um, was also um, um, utilizing a, a number of different um, practices. They were lecturing um, for a part of the class, uh, real time writing on board, following up on some of the concerns, posing questions, answering questions, moving and guiding students. Um, at, but for the most of the, of the class, um, they were engaged in one on one discussions with the student. Whereas in low self efficacy laboratory, we see that the instructor was primarily concerned with lecturing and real time writing on board and students were mostly listening and taking notes. Um, there was some individual activities, individual thinking and problem solving activities in this class as well. But considering that this is a laboratory, the presence of the student code is really much to Um So those were the results or, or, or the observation results presented in this slide. They were triangulated with the self-efficacy results of all students, but then um, one um, important aim of my research was also to focus on gender minority and female students in particular. So for that reason, a focused group interview was also organized to explore 
what specific practices German minority and female students um, describe as contributing to their self-efficacy to, to increase confidence in their capabilities. So one thing that was apparent is that student staff relationships are really important for female and gender minority students. So if they received individualized attention from their um, instructors, if they felt like um, the instructors were friendly, just like they had a positive demeanor. So talking about, you know, friendliness, approachability, patience, understanding, availability as well, just being there for the students. Um, they felt that they were able to build a relationship to their instructors easier and had a more positive learning experience. Whereas um, negative teacher characteristics such as um, arrogance, rudeness and, and, and alike, unavailability really, or, or just not having, not, not, not being really proactive and came to student questions and concerns saying, um, why don't you contact me after the class, come talk to me after the class or write me an email, right? That, that really contributed to students have relationships negatively. Um, certain instructional practices also came up during the focus group interview. So students talked about having a lot of um, instructional support as something that really helped them out. So with, with different quizzes, different practice sheets, videos to watch before class, um, in class, um, uh, utilizing of um, click questions, right? Or just in class discussions, all of those things were viewed very positively by the students. Um, students also narrated uh, receiving practical examples that they can really apply to real life situations as something that can help them understand the content matter better, that it can help them feel more confident um, with uh, the knowledge they're receiving. Um, whereas, you know, lecturers that simply read through the slides um, or classes that were really mainly theory based, those the students were enjoying quite as much and, and, and they felt like they were disengaging. It was hard to feel motivated in those classes. And um, some students also mentioned that, you know, if, if, if the lectures are overwhelmingly um, theoretical, that puts more uh, pressure on the instructors in practice based classes. So in the um, tutorials of that module or in the laboratories of that module, because those classes are only the only well, the, the only class in which the students feel that they can really learn something. Um, stress and anxiety also came up as something that contributes to students' um, confidence negatively. And there are many different um, experiences students describe as contributing to their stress levels. So for many students, first year education is just stressful to begin with because they're you know, in a new environment. Um, they're learning something that perhaps they you know, don't have a lot of previous experience in. And they're also exposed to higher, um, I don't know, higher level content of the subjects that they were previously interested in. Um, but then they also talked about specific um, practices in the classroom that really contributed to their stress level. So, for example, um, having to perform in labs where you know perhaps they don't have any previous instruction in, they don't have so much experience in, and only receiving minimal. Um, instruction at the beginning of the class and then kind of have to figure it out by themselves. And although there are usually, um, there's help available in a laboratory setting. So you have um, three instructors going around. Students that are really struggling, they find it really hard to reach out to their instructors and say, you know, if, if you're just having a problem, that's not that much of an issue. But if you just have no clue what to do at all or where to start, that's really, it's, it's really hard to speak about that. Um, students also felt that laboratories came, you know, with a really high sense of responsibility already, and they were just generally higher stake because they were um, evaluated on their performance in the laboratory setting. Um, and specifically, students also brought up such active learning practices as multiple choice questions when they were timed and graded and uh, cold calling as contributing to their learning experiences negatively. Now, cold calling, it was brought up by students, um, by multiple students, really, which was really surprising because you wouldn't think so many um, instructors would still practice cold calling, especially in first year, in the first semester context, but they do. And that contributes to student um, stress levels, anxiety levels. It's just really awful when you're dealing with a, with a new topic. You don't necessarily know that much about it, or you just received a lot of information. You still need some time to process it, and you're being questioned about it spontaneously and you know 
especially in a high attendance setting where there's many people, everyone's just kind of looking at you, right? Waiting for you to answer. Um, students felt that that was really, really contributing to their stress levels and affecting their confidence negatively, especially if you, you know, you were asked something and you didn't know what to say. Um, and it really brings you down. Knowledge application opportunities and performance achievements were identified as the single factor that contributes to student confidence the most. So whenever they are able to apply the knowledge they receive in their classes in practical situations, so for example, in their laboratories or in their continual assessments, um, that helps reinforce student confidence. Um, some students also talked about being able to engage with their peers about the subject matter and with people outside the university, for example, their parents as contributing to their self, uh, sense of confidence. Um, quizzes especially <laughs> were mentioned as something that were really helpful um, and that helped students feel confident because, especially when they were frequent and, and, and rather small, because it well they helped students um, build up their confidence gradually. And through that sustained feedback, students could also develop a more robust sense of confidence. Um, so taking everything into consideration, it appears that um, instructors that really care about student self-advocacy and that you know really would like to support um, well, all students really, but gen minority and female students in particular, need to focus on creating a positive class atmosphere and um, using considered pedagogical practice. So while it's important to um, focus on student centered um, pedagogical practices, we always have to keep student comfort in mind. So specific, the specific active learning um, methodologies, um, such as, you know, the time and graded multiple choice questions or cold calling uh, practices, they might not work so well with, with all of the students and, or, or you know, they, they, they might do more harm than good in some situations. Um, but basically, instructors that are approachable, available and attentive, instructors that, you know, invest into building those relationships with their students and also facilitate um, pedagogical practice that help students build relationships with other students, um, offer verbal persuasion and try and engage with the students on an individual level. Um, they really can help improve class um, climate. When it comes to the pedagogical practice, active learning methodolo methodology, but with student comfort in mind, instructional scaffolding, um, performance related feedback in regard to active um, learning experience, um, error framing, um, all of those things really contribute to positive learning experience of students and then in turn to student confidence. Um, we also saw from the self-efficacy questionnaire results that students do feel more stressed about exam situations and previous research has proven that um, exams tend to disproportionately disadvantage female and gender minority students in science. So non-exam modes of assessment and diversity of different assessment modes could really help support female and gender minority students even further. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, I was a very, very low confident biology student in oh, the lab. Yeah. <laughs> uh, to the point that I was taught, I was studying to become a biologist and I quit my degree to yeah. go to the most theoretical degree in the world, which is philosophy, not to intervene with things yeah. anymore. And now it makes me think, maybe with better instruction, I would be a biologist yeah. now. Yeah. Yeah. Error framing is just um, asking the um, in the middle inevitability of making mistakes and how valuable making mistakes or right uh, you know how to learn from that, yes. uh, um, <coughs> mistakes and how important that is for us thank you so finola <laughs> yes uh, your paper uh, how i use counter storytelling from crt as a research practitioner and uh, Pinola is a senior lecturer at Dublin and is currently a team leader uh, on the development of an education model for TV Dublin that programs inclusion and belonging in its endeavors to ensure an inclusive university. That is very well written. <laughs> <laughs> Pinola. 
Um, she is involved uh, with the university uh, race equity working group and unconscious bias uh, training. And she, she has a recent doctorate. Well, it's not so recent anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and, uh, in 2020, that focuses on inclusion and belonging in higher education for black and minority ethnic students. So, your thing. <laughs> so if you don't mind, I, I oh, yeah. there. Yeah. Thank you, Finola. Great, thank you and hello everyone in person and also to those of you joining online as well. And um, so with the time slot that I have with you today, I'm going to share with you how I used uh, counter story telling techniques from critical race theory as a research practitioner. So I want to give you the context of the research first as to what I researched and why I did that how I used counter storytelling and in particular and it may give you some prompts to do that in your own practice and then some next steps for us all. Uh, okay so what did I research? Well I wanted to research belonging and inclusion for black and minority ethnic students in higher education and in particular I wanted to look at the racialized experiences of those students who self-identified as being from black and minority ethnic backgrounds. And I engaged with, well, a couple of tenants of CRT, critical race theory, but for the purpose of this presentation, I'm going to focus on counter storytelling and how that allowed me to have a much more nuanced race consciousness with regard to the research that I did. How did I end up in this area? I suppose as an educator for the last two decades, I noticed increased diversity in my classroom from an ethnic and cultural background. And I was always wondering what it is like for those students to navigate a predominantly white campus and academy. And also I suppose higher education in general has seen greater diversity among its undergraduate students, but there's very limited research investigating uh, this area. So central to my research are the voices and experiences of those students who identify as BME. So just before I start, a note on terminology. Um, I interpret BME, Black and Minority Ethnic, if for this study, but it is a contested term, as a lot of language and terms are. But I use contemporary literature at the time to define this term. People like Akil, Arday, Bhopal and Chapman. Uh, but as I said, the, the term is contested in the literature because what this term, BME, attempts to do is capture a diverse range of experiences within one term, which can sometimes not accurately reflect what's going on for individuals in the group. And so I completed my doctorate research in 2020, and the term that I probably would be using now if I was doing it is this one, global majority, and it's increasingly used and it refers to people who are black, African, Asian, brown, dual heritage, indigenous to the global south, or who have been racialized as ethnic minorities. But these people are now in the global majority and they represent about 80% of the population globally. So that's just a, a note on terminology there. I think anyone who's engaged with critical race th theory will find themselves having to engage with critical reflection yourself. Um, and this has been a key learning for me in this process was developing a deepened and emotional understanding of critical race consciousness from the theoretical nuances of CRT. So I'm acutely aware of my white privilege and fragility and how it makes it much easier for me to belong and to access unearned privileges in the academy. And throughout my field work, I have to say, I felt that I represented the white academy and the good white person wanting to research uh, BME students. So I was constantly going through what Costly and Fulton capture as the mental gymnastics uh, of critical reflection, which of course is really important if you're going to engage in work where you are outside of that minority that you're that you're looking to research. And so becoming an anti-racist educator really does involve us going through all these different zones. I certainly started in the fear zone when I was teaching a module for the first time 15, 17 years ago, diversity in the workplace, and I probably avoided some of the issues because I felt uncomfortable. Whereas now I would feel I'm moving all constantly towards the learning and growth zone and just accepting that uncomfortableness in order to, to learn and move on. So critical race theory and counter storytelling. And this is really what sensitized me to a race uh, consciousness narrative. So my research took me to a place known as the Common Room on the Blanchardstown campus of TU Dublin. 
This is a contentious space on the campus and it was identified by the research participants that I interviewed as inclusive and exclusive through photo voice methods that I used in the field work. So I was able to shift the gaze and reveal a counter story on the common room. This was the most photographed space on campus across both categories of inclusion and exclusion for our students. It was inclusive because it was seen as a place to introduce students to different ethnic minorities on campus, but it also appeared to exclude the mainstream white student population as they identified it as a place that was dominated by two ethnicities. So what happened was a culture of segregation has taken place in this space whereby students uh, form their own racially homogenous groups for solidarity and support. And it's a place where they felt that they belonged and could be themselves. So what has happened is an unspoken black space has emerged on a predominantly white campus. Oh, the, the common room reveals then a counter story of inexclusion, actually a term I borrowed from the literature. Uh, so the common room is a site of social interaction and belonging. It's an ethnic enclave for those students who may feel marginalized or on the periphery. Um, and in the research, it has shown that students sometimes retreat or create counter spaces to overcome harmful stereotypes <coughs> and isolation. And the common room certainly does determine who belongs and who does not. It's identified by students as a place to socialize if you are from a certain minority and the social control of this space helps us to understand who feels included and excluded. It's interesting to note though the counter story here is that white norms are judging the non-white behavior in this space, which has been identified as exclusionary, intimidating, deviant from some of the research participants. Yet when I turned the gaze using CRT, we could see this space as a space of inclusion and belonging for some students who uh, felt that the common room had developed a bedrock uh, of belonging for them and for ethnically diverse students to locate themselves where they could be their true and authentic selves. So some next steps for us all, I suppose I, I believe in the idea of positive disruption and to constantly maybe disinter and poke away at things. And so I would ask you, what do you believe is landlocked in your research or your practice? I use the term landlocked as it gave me another perspective uh, on inclusion and belonging in my study. So can you use counter storytelling tenet from CRT to interrogate another perspective that you might not have considered uh, before in your research or in your practice, what's inaccessible, what's enclosed, what's maybe a little bit restricted, uh, that this could help uh, reveal something for you. How can we continue to create a culture of representation? Well, this really does require habit, like flexing any muscle, and building a great habit requires effort and patience, so we don't leave the process halfway through. So I suppose you'll all be aware that following the death of, the jo of George Floyd and the Black Lives Matter movement, Many institutions made statements um, about inclusion and belonging. Museums started to reconsider their inventory. Curricula were revised in higher education institutions and elsewhere. Statues came down. And overnight, bestseller book lists were filled with anti-racist manuals and explorations of whiteness. We can change laws and practices, but we also have to change our minds. Uh, and because this is really the only way you're going to change culture. Otherwise, as per Gary Young's quote on the slide, if you focus on organizations looking different, even as they act the same, you end up not with equal opportunities, but photo opportunities. And really nothing changes at all. So what can I do then? Because I don't come from that minority. But many of us in this room can engage in active allyship. And I really believe this is necessary in creating an inclusive um, environment. And I suppose the initial step for active allyship for any of us is to acknowledge your own biases, uh, to do that critical reflection work, listen to understand the challenges and perspectives that are not your own. Um, and I suppose to constantly uh, check uh, your privilege, your position, and to challenge the status quo when it is safe and uh, good for you to do so. You will run into critics and here's what I find that the critics will always say. So DEIB, diversity, inclusion and belonging, this is just a distraction. Okay, this is a PR move. It's good for the brand. It's good for the university. It's a fad. It's going to roll away out of town and it's going to be replaced by something else. So it's almost like woke washing is replacing greenwashing at the minute. 
Uh, the critics will also say this stuff is too hard. It's too difficult. It's not feasible because it's deeply uncomfortable for some people to go there. So why would we bother at all? It's not going to it's not going to change anything. And the critics will also say, well, how do we measure it? How do we know an exemplar of EDI at TU Dublin? It's too difficult to measure. Well, of course, it's too difficult to measure if you compare it to financial performance ratings, which we are often as the default position around metrics, estimates, targets and performance. But those metrics actually miss the very point of creating an inclusive environment. So what we need is a nuanced understanding of the root causes and deep insight from the perspectives of those that are affected. So what works? Um, I think beginning with diversifying the curriculum um, and making sure that it is representative um, of, of society, which came up earlier as well. Um, I think we need to re-examine, and it has come up too in, in previous presentations today, how we reframe teaching, learning, assessment and feedback. So, for example, if we teach the British Empire as invading and exploiting rather than what's often taught as exploring and settling. <laughs> and then, for me, I suppose, the most important thing is that we do constantly listen for that counter story, especially in an overwhelming whiteness, which the Academy um, is. And so to finish, um, I suppose this one stopped me in my tracks because I'm constantly listening for the counter story. This is Alison Mariella Desir. She's an author, an activist and a runner. And she describes what it's like to run uh, while black from her new book, which I have an order. I can't wait till it arrives. But I'm basing my notes today on an interview that she did with McKinsey and Company. And she writes about the systemic inequalities threatening black runners. And she shares her experience of running in a black body and she looks at the culture of running and how a lot of running races or running competitions are disproportionately white. She describes the microaggressions that she experiences while she's out running. So, for example, people are really surprised to see her in a particular neighborhood running or they say, oh, you run, not expecting someone like her to run. And she often noticed that the police cars tend to slow down and scan mm -hmm. the situation as she's out for her run. So these microaggressions, of course, are indications of who this space was built for. For any of us to run or go out for a jog, we need safe streets, we need clean, clean air and we need running shoes. And these are three things that not everyone has equal access to. And in her interview, she mentions the 10 blessed places to run in America and 90, 90 to 95% of the population of those areas were white. So it would suggest that those whitest places have the best shade, the cleanest streets, great lighting, and I suppose it highlights the systemic nature of the community. So this article really stopped me in my tracks and it made me think about the counter story. And I would consider myself open, wide open to these issues, but I would have missed so many of the things that she talks about based on my experience as a white woman who goes out for a job. So I did find it a powerful piece um, and I think you might too. So that's me. Uh, thank you for listening. And I think I really enjoy this event every year, less so the presenting bit, but I'm presenting. <laughs> Uh, but I do think when you share your ideas, you get insights from others. And I feel that today, that sense um, of connection through the emotional stories and research that's, that's taking place. And I have my uh, references there for sharing the presentations again, should you wish to pursue any more of those. So thanks very much. Interesting. It's very interesting. It makes you think and we reflect. And yeah. Wow. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think next is you. Yeah. Yeah. Is this just Good afternoon, afternoon, everyone. Are we gone? Yeah. We're, we're gone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This one. I don't find the floor. Yeah. That one is, is it? Yeah. Make sure I share the right one. I don't know how you do this. Just, just, just. Down to go down, is it? That way, sorry, that way. Yeah. Perfect. I'm okay. Uh, Brie, you are going to present a paper. Yeah, well, it is there. Developing an anti racism placement resource, the community development and youth work experience. Well, Brie uh, is a senior lecturer in the Department of Humanities at TUW in Blanchester. Brie, they took this from your LinkedIn, so maybe. <laughs> 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 Wherever else you took it from, it wasn't LinkedIn. <laughs> but that's on my to-do list. I do. <laughs> okay, but 
new lecture, I will do, uh, conduct research on issues related to migration, integration, and racism, uh, both uh, in Dublin and at the national level. So you are still doing that, of course. Um, uh, well, that's it. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> LinkedIn might get on this weekend. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, and following on from we did launch our uh, I'll give it a plug our resource uh, yesterday. Um, uh, we will have a copy uh, available electronically in terms of sustainability, um, meeting those strategic goals. But I suppose I'm here. We, were, we got EDI funding for this. Um, so really, but this is a team effort. Um, my uh, colleagues, Georgina uh, Lawler, uh, Liam McGlynn, who are our field worker placement uh, coordinators in year two and year three of the program, Garrett Smith, who is our overall program lead. And we have worked on our anti-racism work over the last two and a half years um, in conjunction with the EDI directorate and Noreen, who's there in the corner, um, that we've looked a lot, worked alongside and who's going to take all the difficult questions. <laughs> um, um, so no, I, I really, I suppose what I want to do today is just give you a tiny little bit of background, the context of where this came from, talk and talk about the EDI funding piece. Um, and obviously, you know, as people have gone along, there's loads of connections in terms of the areas we're working in, the challenges, etc. But the, I suppose, what, what we set out to do, um, so going back to just before COVID, um, I had a student who conducted a piece of research on, um, uh, the, on interculturalism in the youth services in Dublin 15. And what she found uh, was that students and our students were witnessing racism on placement and didn't know how to deal with it. So I was teaching a combating racism module at fourth year level. I suppose it was kind of, for the, you know, it gave us an evidence base to actually did instigate to start to do something. March, we all had the lockdown, pandemic, went online. We obviously, the likes of the killing of George Floyd was mentioned. And suddenly there was, you know, a bit more momentum to actually um, be able to do something or look at this as, as an area. So we applied uh, to the uh, impact funding in 2020 for one of the Lakela team projects. It was a whole, it was a, pr a program approach. And our project was to embed anti-racism in the teaching, learning and assessment of the program. Um, and we had, you know, we were still at home at the time. We had loads of energy, lots of activity. Uh, we co-created webinars with students. We ran anti-racism um, workshops for staff and for students. We fed into policy um, at, a, at an institute level, so the TU Dublin Race Equity Strategy. We fed into policy at a national level. Staff and students would have been involved. The white paper, for example, on ending direct provision at the time. Um, we brought about changes to the module because really our objectives were to um, take, bring about changes to embed anti-racism in the modules, to increase the racial literacy of our staff and their reflective practice, and to support students to be able to recognise racism and then empower them to respond to it. Um, and at the time, we, we applied for, for uh, as I said, EDI funding um, for to develop this um, anti-racism placement resource, which we then launched yesterday. But I suppose... John, just talk to the coach and then, you know, as we started out and what we look to do at the end of first year, we're at the end of that first year and where we got to, you know, was, I, I think it's just the first thing I would say is, is the learning journey. Um, it is a journey. It is ongoing. It's a process. Um, and while yesterday was an important milestone, you know, two and a half years on to it, you know, we have only inched a little bit, a, a, bit, a bit ahead. Um, and some of this, how do you measure it, et cetera, comes into it, whether it's just the assessment around the project as well, from, from, sorry, from what Manula mentioned. But I suppose first and foremost, community development and youth work. Um, it is anti-racism is very much in keeping with the professional values of the programme. And we are a dual endorsed uh, programme. Um, and so the likes of equality, human rights and anti-discrimination would be part of the uh, community development principles, equity and inclusion in terms of the youth work principles. So it sits very nicely with the professional fields where our students uh, work. Uh, one of the principles of community development and youth work, so we work in partnership with our students primarily on, the on this anti-racism work and on the development of the resource. Um, and we have been hugely reliant and we're hugely grateful for our students in terms of the diversity of those student voices who have informed the work, because we are a quite predominantly Irish, not exclusively program team, but we are teaching in classrooms that are far more diverse. Um, and so you know, we, have, we have worked and we are co-creating, if you like, and learning on this together. As I said, it is a whole program approach. Um, and I suppose, what do we mean by being anti-racist? In the words of Angela Davis, it's not enough not to be not racist, but we must be anti-racist. So it is a call for action that we're actively opposing. 
staff and students and to bring about social change. And this would align very much with our programme uh, values because our mission is to produce students who are agents of change. <coughs> So this is a piece of action research. It's ongoing. We have gathered you know, data to obviously inform what we're doing, and it's been quite an iterative process. Um, but just to, just to share, I suppose, uh, a few insights of when the original piece of research was done, the students were talking about in a focus group about experiencing, or sorry, not experiencing, witnessing, sorry, racism, um, and not knowing what to do with it. But we start, once we started running focus groups with students, and these were fourth year students were the first group that we would have run with, what started to come up was students' experiences that weren't being captured by staff, that weren't being captured in their portfolio, in their placement. You know, it, it, so I suppose once we started asking questions and digging, we were able to see, um, you know, some, some, some of the issues that were going on. Um, so this was one of the students who talked about, um, uh, you know, feeling, feeling helpless about an incident in second year placement of someone attacking the student verbally about a visible marker of difference. Um, and, you know, the student described at the time that, you know, was shocked, didn't know how to react and didn't know any of the, uh, uh, what were the options, if you like. So from this, um, it is, I suppose, informed the development of the third section of our um, resource, which is what we would call kind of the report and support, but mapping out exactly for students and obviously then for staff, what happens, you know, what are the pathways and what, what happens. Um, other issues that have come up, and sorry, that student was from a minority ethnic background. The next student is from a majority background, a white Irish student who said, you know, dealing, I struggle to deal with it, particularly in a professional way when it's a staff member. Um, and this power differential, this has come up with other, because I'm taking data from our social care students as well, this has come up particularly even if it's the students themselves experiencing it. They just want to get their head down, get on with their placement and not fail their placement. Um, and the third one, I suppose, we're not for a moment saying that racism is, is, is something that exists on placement. It's a global phenomenon, but it is a pervasive feature of Irish society. It is in our institutions, it is in our communities, it is in TU Dublin, as well as everywhere else. So I suppose the, and this, the, this third student, um, uh, who's also from a minority ethnic background, um, spoke about it's not, you don't feel safe enough to report, and it's not being talked about, that was on the TU Dublin, Blanchardstown campus, but I'm sure it would be echoed um, elsewhere as well. And I suppose part of this is not just about change in a programme, but about feeding into institutional change as well. So just in terms of the academic bit, the framework that we're using is developing racial literacy, and it is an ongoing piece of work as developing any kind of literacy is. Uh, and I suppose in a nutshell, what it, what it involves is learning, learning what racism is, the different dimensions, um, I really liked Elaine's quote earlier, except I can't remember it, about the past, I suppose the history bit, really important in the context of the Irish complexity, colonizer, colonized, I think that that's, that the, or, or the complexity of Irish history really important to understand how it's shaped the present today. Um, but obviously it's not just, it doesn't just operate at an individual level, but at those at structural institutional level as well. But I think the really important bit as well is about that unlearning. We've had a lot of chats with our students. We ran our pre-placement workshops this week, you know, around unlearning those racist beliefs, the ideas, the opinions, the stereotypes that are out there all around us. Beverly Tatum talks about the smog. We all breathe in the smog, um, whether we're from a majority or a minoritized background. Um, and I suppose it's, you know, so it is that unlearning bit um, as well. Race is a structure of power. It, it shapes society in unequal and in oppressive ways. And as Elaine said, you know, it intersects with other power differentials based on gender, class, ability, sexuality, etc. So we are adopting, while we're talking about racial literacy, we're adopting an intersectional approach. And I should say class would be one of the big dimensions our students would be looking for anyway, in terms of the communities that they'd be working in, in terms of generally predominantly where the youth services are based anyway. And the final thing, this has kind of come up, I suppose, through our work is a need to develop awareness of whiteness as a structure, particularly in the Irish context between educators and students and how this operates as well. So we got the funding from the EDI for which we were really grateful and then we had to go and do a bit of work. <laughs> so so um, I suppose the overall aim of the resource is to better prepare students to recognise and address racism in practice placement settings. So we set out, so that would have been last year, we started compiling uh, things together based on the feedback from the previous 12 months. So the first year, the Lakelo Award, we took all our feedback, the focus groups, the surveys, et cetera. And that, if you like, has informed 
uh, informed the gathering together of what we then, what, what, uh, as was well three sections, we went out to our students. So I, my, my fourth year students in their combating racism module, they gave us feedback on what we had developed. We developed last year, so our students have a week of pre-placement um, workshops, which, they, which happened this week. So we developed a workshop along on these three sections. And then we ran those workshops last year, piloted, and then we surveyed staff and students and ran a focus group action afterwards in terms of the feedback. Um, we also would have collaborated externally. So for the third section, so, sorry, so, so in terms of our third section, which is the one what we call the support and the report for what, to show students what they do, we would have worked with the Immigrant Council of Ireland and their protocol on victims of racism and discrimination. That has really, uh, you know, anyone who knows, is familiar with that document will see how it is mirrored in the approach that we took. We also worked with the Irish Network Against Racism. Um, they would have been involved in delivering anti-racism workshops to start out, and they would have given us feedback into the into the resource as well. Um, and then we, this year, if you like, we've done a second lot of piloting of it. But sorry, the first, so the first, the, the feedback that we took on board of all of those last year with the workshops, I suppose there were two or three key areas. The first one was kind of time and content. So while the resource is there, it is only part and parcel of a bigger piece of work, you know, and I kind of think back cringing to my first time I would have delivered a lecture a new module and you're trying to stuff so much information in there that it's very hard to see what we really need and, you know, step back from it. So we definitely did that. Too much information, information overload, it's emotive, it's complex. And um, students need more time, we need more time to discuss. Like that, that, that was part of, of, the, of the issue. Um, so I suppose what we've done is what we did was stepped back and reflected on that. We've obviously pr pr produced our document. And sorry, before I, before I move on to I suppose what, we're, what we're now doing in the learning from it. So we've literally three sections. First section just talks through those basic concepts, you know, race, ethnicity, racialization, racism, et cetera, its impact. Look at some of the forms. We have about anti-traveler racism and anti-black racism. This is a live document. We've only printed a certain number of copies of the funding allowed, but we have what we have is we can then update it ourselves. So we do want to add a section on anti-Muslim racism, racism, for example, is one, one example. So you know it will be added to policy and legislation. We're expecting with the new National Action Plan Against Racism that ever comes out, the new hate crime legislation. You know, so we want a document that we can actually update. The second section of it is more the practice-based piece in terms of um, uh, case studies, activities, um, where students then will, you know, look and it develops incrementally at an individual level and then challenging racism. Yesterday, we were doing yesterday morning with our third years at more of a community response and at a community level. And these have all been taken from, you know, live experiences of our students or those out in the field. And I mentioned the third section. So I suppose really, you know, while the resources there, it's only one bit of, you know, a much broader piece of work. And I suppose what has come out through all of the feedback from the students and the staff on this is actually, we need to go right back to first year. So I would think by the time we deliver those pre-placement workshops next year, the year after, they will just be the case studies around practice and that's it. So we have started and we're going back again now, next week and the week after to remap particularly the first year modules. Start in first year, I suppose, what well, we have found, and then literally that we're going to scaffold this, develop it incrementally with an intersectional approach, uh, but develop it incrementally over time. Um, and this is in keeping with the limited academic research that is out there, which shows that students need this repeated, robust, deep engagement with the concepts, vocabulary, skills, and dispositions. So it isn't a one workshop, it isn't one resource, it is revisiting and visiting. You know, um, Fanula talked about the reflective practice. Um, she also talked about a change in mind that it is transformative learning. We're changing mindsets, we're changing beliefs. This takes time as well. And the other thing is, these are complex concepts. I think that's really important as well. You know, I felt the second year struggling a bit during the week. Um, so I think we need to, you know, to get our head around things like structural thinking. It is, it takes time, it is difficult. And I think we need to meet the students and the staff where they're at with regards to that um, as well. So this is just, I suppose, the kind of the last bit. One of the key things that has come out of the pilots last year is we need to go back and start at the self. You know, and Fanula mentioned positionality, how our social positions and power, they influence our identities, what we've access to within society. Uh, 
Leslie Tatum talks about that, the, or not, no, uh, Celia Ruth talks about the archaeology of self. And it is that idea of, we were, we even, Noreen was in yesterday afternoon with the second years, I'm just starting going back looking at biases. Where do they come from? You know, what can you do to kind of be aware of it? That we all have at the end of the day. And there is a bit of reluctance at times, particularly from some of the younger students, to kind of say, I don't have any, you know, I don't have any biases, or I don't, but I mean, once it starts, you know, understanding this is normal. We grew up in a society, we're bombarded by them, the media, social media, etc. Um, so it is, I suppose, creating that we need to create those spaces within the programme and not, as I said, just this workshop or workshops, um, but we need to start in modules. So that's what we have done. So in, in terms of the counter stories, we have a full induction week in first year. And as part of it, students do what we call a life map or a life story at the end. And they share whatever they want to share. Now, the idea of that is literally to create a kind of, to start to make connections in terms of building relationships and to build solidarity. So we get students who experience discrimination <coughs> on lots of different grounds. Um, but really what we need to do, and some of those are the counter stories. So it's making visible the race and ethnicity and lots of other dimensions, if you like, of difference that, were, that are within the group. Um, so obviously, it, you know, it gives voice to dominant narratives, but it also allows those counter narratives to come through. And I, I've sat in, 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 in tutorials where the students have shared them and they're really powerful. Um, but what we need to do now is to more formally, you know, they've done that, but we need to start and have, so we have a follow on activity. We've activities from the resources. We did it with the second years and the third years yesterday, but starting off looking at our positionality. You know, and where in terms of our identity, because for an awful lot of us, we might be in dominant social groups for certain elements and in marginalised groups for others. And so just, you know, at the starting point, getting the students to think about that. And obviously, then we develop in terms of social practice. Um, and the other thing, what the, I suppose, because what we did find was an awful lot of it, the focus was on individual racism. You know, and that's what that's what a lot of students deal with in the youth services. And it can be between, for example, young people from different minority ethnic backgrounds. Uh, we did a lot of students out in traveller projects. Um, you know, some of, some of that, is, so it's varied, but an awful lot of it is individual racism. Um, and I suppose what we what we realised was we need to start with that self to be able to incrementally make that connection um, to these, you know, to our, 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 to how the power and how over history these identities have been constructed um, and what that means when we're part of that dominant uh, identity. And I suppose a particular challenge, and, obviously is around whiteness as a structure, um, recognizing not all white people are privileged in the same way um, and recognizing that within that, you know, within that group, we have people of different, you know, nationalities, et cetera, as, as well as differences in social class ability. But it is really common for people to, I suppose, you know, the, the, and, and what we would have found is out there in the literature that, it's, you know, people who are part of that dominant white settled group, racism isn't an issue for me and it doesn't involve me. And I suppose it's that step towards realising we are all part of the system, that we are either being advantaged or disadvantaged, you know, and that idea that privilege doesn't mean that things are easy for us. Um, and particularly, you know, we had lots of conversations yesterday and the day before, because for the first time, we are probably sending students out next week in more difficult social contexts than we ever have. So we spoke about the protests in, you know, Ballymun or East Wall in, in terms of, uh, or, or Drimner or wherever, I'm just picking the Dublin examples, I know they're elsewhere, um, you know, in more disadvantaged working class communities. We spoke about the counter protests, the likes of Northside for All, there was a solidarity rally in uh, Fairview last week, you know, communities mobilising together, um, East Wall for All, Ballymun for All, so that positive kind of community support that has come out as well, and the narrative of the far, far right. Well, it, that is the reality, I suppose, that is out there. Um, uh, and I think it's just so it's just that idea of, you know, being white does not being being privileged, but pushing things like, you know, housing for all, housing for the Irish, sorry, housing for all is obviously what we are pushing, you know, housing for the Irish, what does that mean? What is the narrative? What is the discourse behind that? And, you know, the, the, so just kind of, you know, I suppose just thinking around this together. And I suppose that would be the final thing. It's not just the students. Um, I, I'm interested when you say it's hard, uh, Fanula, like, or the critics say it hard, but I think we have to say it is hard, is, is first of all. I would be saying, you know, any of these areas, it goes, takes time to develop. Like critical thinking in that, you know, they, they are, um, you know, they are much, they take time for students to be able to, to, to do it, but also for staff, for educators. So like what we have done is we have got staff to share their examples of practice. 
So last year, you know, so what we're trying to do is to support other staff. Because I think my final point is about sustainability. Like we can't have, you know, a, a, you know, funding resources. We need we need staff to be a support staff to do this. And we need things to be sustainable at the end of the day. So they do need to be embedded in. They need to do part of programs, whatever, whatever, whatever we're whatever we're doing. Um, and I think we need to recognize um, that as well. I'll leave it there. <laughs> Project has come, you know, like from and, and, and great use of EDI money. <laughs> <laughs> great use, it's amazing, you know, how much you what you have been able to, to, to do. Okay, the next presentation is also uh, another on oh, another project founded by the EDI That's, fund. Yeah. Um, we encourage all the groups that they get, uh, groups of individuals to get uh, EDI funds for a project to present uh, their work and their results uh, because it's very, very nice to, to hear and to share and for us to learn. So the next, the next uh, presentation, online interactive design workshop for female students in technology programs in TU Dublin. Now, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourselves because, Michelle, I have your yeah, bio because yeah. you sent it to me, yours, yeah. but I don't have, so it's better, it's very briefly, just one sentence, you introduce who you are uh, to the rest. Yeah, and yeah I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do that anyway, so. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. Okay. So, um, I'm bamboozled now after Breed. <laughs> it was a lot of information. <laughs> but uh, anyway, we'll start. So thanks very much for inviting us here, and we're delighted to be able to share our experience. Um, uh, we we um, ran an event, an online interactive design workshop for female students in technology programs in TU Dublin. It was during the pandemic, so that's why it was online. And we're part of a group. Uh, we've called ourselves With You, Women in Technology United. Um, which we set up a couple of years ago. So this was just a subset of that group, that wider group, and it's the Pan University group. Um, Marie is going to tell you more about that though towards the end of our presentation. So um, there were eight of us working on the on this event, and I'll just introduce us anyway first. So four of us are here. So I'm Catherine Newby, and I teach in the School of Electrical and Electronic Engineering. And Marie is also, Marie Armstrong is also a teacher in the School of Electrical Electronic Engineering. Um, Michelle Luby then, no relation, yeah. is <laughs> also a teacher in the School of Mechanical Engineering. And Susan Linet is also a teacher in the School of Mechanical Engineering. And then there were four other members who aren't here today. Um, so we had a big team working on this one event, but uh, we, we get together kind of regularly and Marie will tell you all about that. But the other members were Mary Luby, yes, a relation. <laughs> She's also a lecturer in um, the School of Mechanical Engineering in Blanchardstown. Jane Hanratty, um, a, a, a School of Mechanical Engineering. She actually came up with the With You uh, acronym. And Anne-Marie McKeown, School of Mechanical Engineering, I think, as well. And uh, Karen Fitzgerald, who is in Tala, but she started with us in Blanchetown. That's her, how we knew her so well. She's good of mechanical And she's good of mechanical engineering as well. So um, the sort of the, the workshop sort of centered around the idea of universal design and diversity in technology design. And it was sort of uh, centered around the importance of the female <coughs> voice in, design, in technology design. And one of our guest speakers is here, actually, Margaret. So Susan is going to tell you all about the the actual running of the event itself and how we how we did how we ran the event. And then Michelle is going to talk to you about um, the outcomes from the event and sort of the learnings that we made, the obstacles we faced, and things like that, and sort of the way the steps that we're going to take moving forward. And then Marie is going to tell you all about the With You Network itself, kind of. Uh, and, you know, the more you learn, the more we wonder about the <coughs> words we used. You know, <laughs> we, we did we did sort of we aimed this at female students in the technology programs. 
and now with all the learning we pro you know it's we probably should have gone for um gender minority rather than female but um you live and learn and that's what we're here we're doing here mm -hmm. So um, I'll hand you over now to Susan. Susan. I, yep. To Susan, and she's going to tell you all about the um, yeah. the event okay. itself. Sorry, I didn't turn yeah. 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 So we did an interactive workshop, and as Catherine was saying, we did it online. So we broke it down into two pieces. So we had the first hour, we had some very generous speakers come in and give us their time. And being online, it was great because people were more available. And then the second hour, we had our little interactive workshop. So our keynote speakers on the day was Avril Bain, then Sarah Jane Delaney, she's a professor of inclusive computer science, Daniel Keelty was from industry, and Margaret is here today. <coughs> so Sarah Jane gave us a nice talk on AI and bias in data. So the AI systems are becoming every day in our world, and the systems learn to make decisions. They said lots of examples would contain bias, so we've loads of bias in the world. So this was really interesting, and it was the AI and the bias in data, and they reflect historical or social inequalities, which has kind of come up a couple of times today, so it's kind of re one of them really topical things. Uh, Daniel was our industry speaker, so Daniel had worked in the design areas of automation, most for medical devices, and he gave his industry perspective on a gender bias and the opportunities that they're there in design and technology related areas. So reflecting back to what Elaine said earlier about how things were always designed for the white man. So and how the, for Daniel's example was, you know, the stab vest the guards where they were designed for men. They weren't designed for women and the shape of women and things like that. So a lot of things have to be redesigned. So he gave his point of view on the gender bias in the design area. And then Margaret, who's here today, kindly gave us a talk on universal design and how one size doesn't fit all. And so in other words, good design enables and includes and poor design disables and excludes. And universal design is a process of creating products that are accessible to people in a wide range of abilities, disabilities and all the diverse of people. That was a lovely talk. Thank you, Margaret. So that was our first hour and we had a lovely talk and it was nice to hear from people in industry and being online and we were all locked away from each other. So it was nice to see and um, for the students that came and joined us to see people in the real world and they were doing real jobs. So the second hour then we had what we called an interactive design challenge. So being April 2021, we were still kind of coming out of lockdown. So our topical hand sanitizing station, we asked them to design because we'd all encountered them. We'd all found a good one and a bad one. So we asked them to think about improving some current models, universal design, overcoming problems, user specifications, and the location it was going to be used in, and taking some of the things that they heard from the speakers as well. So we divided the groups into we had enough for five groups. So we, because we were doing this on Teams, we were able to use the breakout rooms, and then we were able to use the whiteboard facility on Teams as well. So. We created the Padlet so they could all upload their designs when they were finished. So you can see, hopefully you can see some of them are a bit small there, but they all came up with really different ideas. They had all pulled on their experience that they had, you know, they didn't think they were designers, but then when they started to pull on their ideas, pull on previous experiences and went, oh, hang on, I didn't like that one, I like that one. But this location could do it a better sanitizing station. So you can see each of them came up with a really diverse idea and, and really, they really engaged with the whole thing and were very, when they came back at the end, when we brought the breakout rooms back together, they were really engaged and really, really enjoyed the activity. So I'll pass you on to Michelle to let you know the outcomes then. Yeah, brilliant. And the survey that we ran during the online activity. Yeah, so thanks very much, Susan. So this event was a celebration of women and design, but it also looked at the issues and the challenges and the opportunities that were available for women and gender minorities within the technology sector. And currently in third level within engineering and technology programmes, women are underrepresented. And in some programmes, they would account for just 10% of the students on the programme. So the objective of this project was to hold an informative and an interactive event which aimed at in increasing the engagement of female and gender minority students, improving retention and also providing an opportunity for them to develop a community of practice. 
So when we were doing this, and um, it was mentioned already that we recognised that all genders should be included in initiatives like this. So we had a discussion of, you know, who who will we invite? Will we? Is this solely for female students, or should we open it up, um, you know, to all students? And it was it really became apparent to us that it has to be open to all people. It has to be inclusive. That, for example, the male voice has to be there. They have to be part of the solution, and they have to hear about the issues that 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 we are presenting. Presenting. So it's important that all are invited to events such as this so they get to hear about the issues, the challenges and the opportunities around being a female and an gender minority within these sector, sectors. So while the event was aimed and we targeted our female students, we actually issued the invitation to all students. One of the challenge we, challenges we had was how do we get the students to come to the event in the first place? Because as you know, students are very busy, they've got a high schedule. So how do we get them to buy into this sort of event? And the project was a great opportunity. And one of the goals of the project was to extend or expand the Witchu network, which had been in place, but it, it was it localized on the Blanchardstown campus. So we wanted to expand this as a pan-university network. So this event was fantastic for us because we suddenly found out who were, you know, who are the female voices in all of the technology programs um, across all of the campuses. And Marie will tell you more about that um, later on. But the network that was then invaluable for us when we wanted to reach out to student groups across the university to tell them about this event. Okay. There was 44 participants at the event, and this included 24 students from across the three campuses. So it was a really good opportunity for the students themselves to meet with students from other courses and also from other campuses and to increase their network. And we had an icebreaker activity within the design workshop that Susan told you about, which helped them to get to know each other. So it was about you know, getting them together and getting them to work interactively. We asked the students to complete a survey at the end of the event, and I'll tell you a little bit about the survey um, feedback in the next slide. So we provided each person, each student who came to the workshop, we gave them a certificate of participation, and this is the certificate that we designed for them. <coughs> and um, the winning team, so it was a competition. So in when the students broke into um, breakout rooms and design teams, and they, the challenge that um, Susan described, they, it was actually a competition. So they produced their um, designs and posted them onto the Padlet. And in another room, we had um, a judging panel who comprised the speakers that we had, and they judged the designs and under certain criteria criteria and um, we had prizes then for the winning team. They all got something obviously and they all got the certificate of participation but we had prizes for the winning team and the prize that we gave them was a Fujifilm Instax smartphone printer and this a prize was picked deliberately because it's around communication and we felt that this sort of prize could then be used by the students in you know developing their network. Uh, the program also worked with a graphic designer to design a logo for the Witchu network, and you can see it there, and some other uh, promotional materials. So you see just a sample of them there. So um, the survey outcomes, the survey gave us an opportunity to really look in depth at, and get in-depth feedback from the participants. And one thing we were very interested in was seeing whether this, the participants found thought that their communication and teamwork skills were improved by attending and participating in this type of event. And we heard um, earlier about you know, increasing self-efficacy, increasing confidence. And we felt that these skills are important in being able to establish your social network and having a voice. So we got really good positive feedback and students all said that they felt their skills in these areas were, were increased. They really enjoyed working in the small teams, in the small design teams, and being able to work together and interact and brainstorm and ideate and problem solve. So we got very good feedback from that. We asked the students would they be interested in taking part in a focus group to explore the experience of gender minority groups in technology programmes in TU Dublin. And we were delighted that 10 students said, yes, they'd be interested in participating in this focus group. So that's a piece of work that we intend to do um, following on from this. OK, so uh, other um, feedback that we got, we asked them, how has this event been a positive experience for them? Now, we had lots of feedback on this, but I just picked out um, three of the quotations. So one of them said, it's been a positive experience as it was really informative about gender biases in the STEM sector. 
The design challenge was enjoyable and fun. I found this event extremely insightful. It was so interesting to learn about bias we women face in technology. This event has opened my eyes. The third one is some of the ideas of how things affect certain people make me think in a different way because it's hard to think from another perspective when you haven't experienced it. So learning to think of other people was a good reminder. So these are really insightful um, feedbacks. And, you know, what it's really interesting to see how these participants linked the two parts of the event. So they took on board what was being said in the first part of the event in terms of universal design, in terms of you know, bias and so on. And they all of these um, feedbacks show that they all recognize the importance of having an awareness around these issues and in particular around the biases that are experienced by gender minorities within these sectors. We asked them whether they'd be interested in being an ambassador for the programme they're studying on and getting involved in promotion of it. And 71% said they would. We asked them whether they'd be interested in getting information on future future related events, and 86% said they would. We told them about the TU Dublin Student Society, WISTEM, and asked them would they be interested in being part of a wider TU Dublin Society for the promotion of women in STEM, and again, 71% said they would. A key question was, how do the participants think that a greater gender diversity can be achieved in technology programmes? Again, we got lots of feedback on this, and I've just pulled out a few of them that I thought were particularly insightful. So one student said, our participant said that more events like this, I'm in a male orientated class in TU Dublin, but I think realistically it should be starting from an earlier, earlier age. This was a great event. Um, so we have more events like this include different speakers and scenarios, i.e. women in engineering, construction, male dominated workforces. A second quote was, I think as role models to the younger generation, we should teach everyone about the awareness of the design procedure and begin encouraging and promoting science, technology, engineering design to girls and women. And I liked this third one. It said, um, it could be achieved by encouraging successful women to express themselves to a younger generation. So I think they're really ins uh, insightful responses. And what I particularly liked was that it, they recognised that they themselves were the role models to younger girls. So that was really important that they recognise that. And all of them seem recognise that awareness and engagement in STEM needs to happen at a very young age. So that's really important as well. And they, um, you know, they recognize the importance of having these sort of events. So I'm going to finish with that and pass over to our last speaker, who's Marie. So um, I'm going to talk about um, how the, the, the workshop um, springboarded the network um, to become Pan um, University. So we were eight people on Blanchardstown organizing this uh, net, the workshop and then we invited people from across speakers from across the university and then <coughs> after that we said we, we'll spread this around the university so now at the moment women in technology united is across three faculties engineering um, and built environment computer and data and digital and also business from a business technology program it's across nine schools and ten disciplines within that school so we would have all come together in a meeting after the workshop and it was quite a large group of, of women at that stage um, and it was an effective workshop and our meeting and the first thing we wanted to do was to find our goals and to have concise you know goals so the two goals that we have are to retain students in technology courses and increase increase gender diversity in technology courses and that's in line with sustainable development goals and to um, create pathways for all and specifically to focus on gender minorities, not just female, not just women, but just the whole gender minority is what we decided. Um, so how do we achieve those aims? So what we do is, um, like the results of the survey, they were saying more events like that. So we have had coffee mornings in the first week of semester. So if you find out in your first week of semester, you're the only person who came back into third year as a female in engineering, that you can meet other people. And that was very effective. We've had, um, we always celebrate International Women's Day for the last few years, and we've had graduates come in and talk to the students. And we learn where the graduates are getting jobs. The students love to hear from young people who are just a little bit older than them, and they're telling them about their job. 
we've had scholarship application workshops. So like when I was in college, I didn't know about scholarships that were there and there is, you know, but it's getting the message out to every student. So we've had a workshop where we um, have, a, again, a student who gained a scholarship coming in talking to students about how he gained the scholarship and how he did the application and how he found his present job. So even having students who are just a few years old, or graduates who are just a few years old and talking to the students has been very good for them. And then we've had guest speakers like that shop, workshop. Um, and so the whole network is about, um, so achieving the aims by bringing the network together. So when we find in the first years, they, um, you know, they're, they're creating a network. Like this year, we asked them to share numbers if they wanted to. And they were, you know, so they were all, um, they're brought together from um, different groups. We're reaching out to school and it's all about promoting diversity and inclusion in technology courses. So another thing we've done is huge promotion of it. So we, when what we've done for International Women's Day is that we would we would design one poster for International Women's Day, and then because it might happen at a different time on different campuses, we duplicate the poster about eight times on Canva, and each campus would take the same promotional material and put in their date, time, who is that. So it's got a uniform kind of message across all the university with the same style. Um, another thing we've done is we set up uh, an email and every one of these things that we set up took huge discussion. How was the email? Where was the dot going to be? What, you know, so, and then contacting the, the office to set it up and getting their input into it. As Michelle said earlier, we had a graphic designer to design a logo and we set up the web um, page to detail our aims and how we were going to achieve them on the EDI network page. So that's available too. And then in communicating and getting out to the students, we set up Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter. But I find that Instagram is the busiest. So even the students who are just graduates are more active on Instagram. So you can see here, we've been posting up the scholarship deadlines and there's one coming up on Monday and, and um, we we'll post that again. So it's followed by students. Engineering companies have started to follow us. In fact, some Intel contacts. So the, the way to network is becoming a point of contact. So Intel Research actually contacted us and asked us, you know, we want we're on a hiring and um, we're on a hiring drive, and we need to set quotas for diversity in our engineering departments. We don't know what to set them at because we can't set them at 50% and then the graduates in Ireland are not there. So they were asking us what, how, what's our percentage of, of gender minorities graduating so that they could set their, um, you know, their quota for hiring gender minorities. Um, so, and then we're connecting, there's other universities following us and we're following them. So Munster Technology University. And um, so we, we communicate uh, scholarships, events and deadlines. And then we have LinkedIn and we have Twitter. We have we communicate via email. Each lecture has got a list of um, gender minorities. And the other thing about um, inviting people to the workshops, we have another big discussion about who we invite. So we have a list of the female students, but that doesn't catch all. So when we're doing the uh, network events, we would send an email out to everybody saying, if you identify as a gender minority, you come along. So we're not saying you're invited. We invite everybody and whoever feels they, they want to come along. Mm -hmm. It gives that opportunity for people to, to feel like they're invited. And um, so again, another thing we did was we extended the meetings to invite males inputs and voice at the meetings. So um, and, and that happened. And we've also connected with the, the women in STEM clubs. And that student in Tala was talking to us at the meeting and we want her voice to talk to the students at the next event. And we were thinking about recording her message so that it could, you know, um, for pan, pan university events, so that message could be given to everybody at everybody's um, on campus International Women's Day event. So um, we've done a lot of work, all, you know, seeded by the EDI funding uh, to expand the network and include everyone. And there are, um, there are, you know, QR scans for joining up to the groups anyway. So thank you very much. Listen, it's one o'clock. I am very, very sorry. I have to jump to another meeting. Somebody is waiting for me downstairs for another meeting. Uh, questions and answers, of course. Noreen, would you mind? Sure. No problem. <laughs> Covering me. <laughs> very, very sorry. No, you're right. <laughs>
Okay, so a, a range of very interesting papers. I hope you all have lots of questions written down. Um, who would like to start? Oh, oh let's see. Sorry. <laughs> Yes. Um, some of the matter questions, but some of the comments. Um, I just wanted to propose that we we review uh, using words like complex and difficult when we are talking about EDI. Nobody wants to do something that's difficult. So if you come and you're proposing to me, and then you say, "Well, but this is going to be difficult for you," how engaged do you think I'm going to be? And because every time we talk about ETI and, and we start saying, oh, but this is going to be very difficult for you. It's not difficult. We are talking about it. We need to start thinking about talking about it can't be more difficult than experiencing it. Because I have to think about going to events every day before I leave my house. I have to say, am I going to get the bus? Do I have the energy to cope with whatever is going to be? put in my face and do I want to do it and sometimes I don't go to things because of that because I don't want to get on the bus because I don't want to face that one person who's going to mess up my day so maybe we need to start reviewing when we are <coughs> talking to people about EDI that the words we're using are not causing people to disengage and um and another thing is to when we talk about racism which I'm also learning, by the way, because I used to think racism was very simple. If you're educated, you're not going to experience it. That was my take until I came here. And um, there's a, a, a man called Andrews. Okay. I just want to pause you there, Penelope. Sorry, there's actually a class coming in, yeah. which, oh. we didn't know, which we didn't know. Yeah. I don't think we should all leave. leave. Um, so can we just stand outside and we'll try and find another room and go yeah. to just have a short discussion? If you want to, yeah. obviously no pressure to stay. It's those online. I'm so sorry. We uh, messed up here. But anyway, we will reconvene in the hallway just 